So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers episode number 182. This is Friday, November the 4th. My name is Frederick Dunn and this is The Way to Be. So thank you for being here today. It is 62 degrees Fahrenheit outside, which is 17 Celsius, but in here, in the Way to Be building, it is 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Pretty nice. So I thought I'd pop out here since it's a really nice day. And uh, we have some really good weather. Not normal for this time of year. And uh, we're turning our clocks back this weekend, possibly for the last time. They might do away with daylight savings time. What's your opinion about that? So it's going to be, you know, the sun will be setting at 5 o'clock around here starting next week. So things are weird. Anyway, if you're new, welcome. And if you've been here before, of course, you already know that the topics that we're going to discuss today will be listed down in the video description. So please look there if you want to know the topics that we're going to cover. Also, there will be relevant links for more information and uh, some other YouTube videos if it's pertinent. Also, at the end of today's video, I'm going to take you out in the bee yard. We're going to look at some landing boards and I'm going to narrate that and tell you a little bit about what we're looking at. So I'm glad you're here. Let's get right into it. These topics were submitted over the past week, some as recent as a half an hour ago. That's right, I'm on it. So question number one comes from Gary from North Carolina. I need to move my hive. I messed up putting it under a tree. Now the leaves have fallen out and the birds are roosting above my hive. My question is what time of day or night is a good time to move the hive and how far? I've heard two feet or two miles. I need to move it 10 feet. I only have one hive. So that actually makes it much easier if you're moving a hive, just one, and you don't have other colonies for your bees to migrate into, otherwise drift is what it's called. So here's what I've recommended. This topic comes up fairly often, and especially this time of year, so it's kind of easy. I like garden carts, the metal ones, with the big inflated pneumatic wheels. And they have the sides that flip down, and they have a very heavy capacity, and the reason I'm bringing it up it's because garden carts are valuable to backyard beekeepers because we can haul our honey supers on it when it comes time to harvest and things like that. Another thing that you can do with it, and that's why I'm mentioning it related to this question, is you can put your beehive on the cart and move it two feet every night. Until, so that's just, you know, five nights. You, got, you want to go 10 feet. You could probably get away with moving it farther because you only have one hive. There's not a lot of confusion going on there. And assuming that you don't have a lot of other beekeepers around you, I think it might be fairly easy. But this applies to those who are moving their beehives 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, and so on. Put it on a cart, roll it a couple of feet a night, put bricks down so it doesn't roll after that. And then each day they'll reorientate. And here's the interesting thing about bees, by the way. They're very smart. And uh, bees figure out where something is going to be based on incremental movements day by day, which is really interesting, by the way. So if you, for example, move your beehive on a cart like that, a garden wagon, and you pull it a couple of feet every day, and also part of the question was what time of day is the best time to do it? Do it at night, of course, easier. and. Uh, the bees will forecast where it's going to be once these increments are predictable. And then you're going to find out that when it arrives in its final destination, and if you had no cart there, so that's key. If there was no cart and no hive there, the bees would go to the next place based on the increments that you've already demonstrated. Very interesting, but of course you're not going to fool your bees like that and you're going to uh, have the cart there for them and their hive will ultimately be in its final destination. Bees will be very confused, but they'll figure it out pretty quick. Moving on to question number two. This is from Rodney Rowland from Muskego, Wisconsin. I have a Langstroth long horizontal hive and it currently has 22 frames in it and it's ready for winter. I would like to put hive alive fondant as an emergency feed, but not sure where to place it on top. Should it be over the cluster now or move it forward to plan for the movement during winter? And that's a great question. And for those of you who have looked at my Long Langstroth Hive design, uh, by the way, the prints are free for those that want to do something like that. But if you're putting fondant over it, 
because of something else I wanted to mention about fondant since we're bringing it up, Hive Live Fondant. Um, there are cover boards on your Long Langstroth Hive. For me, they are red oak cover boards. They're four inches wide and two of them have holes drilled in the top and then we just put a placeholder board over the top of the hole. hole. So uh, I don't think it's critical where your fondant is down the line. Now we know as winter progresses, the bees are gonna move farther away from the entrance and they're going to, in a perfect world, consume the honey resources that they've got stored. So they will be migrating towards the back recesses of your long Langstroth horizontal hive. So the question is, should you have it kind of forecast to the end? You could, and here's the logic. You know, there's no one answer for this, but this is just the way I think of it. Where are your bees going to be? Yeah, we want them to use their honey also. So they'll be consuming honey as they go. But the other part is that they tend to kind of spread out as winter goes. And that's because they start to establish brood, which means now the cluster starts to open a little bit. They'll favor the brood, but part of them will move along so that they can warm and consume the honey that is capped underneath on the frames that they're going to hover over. So they'll cluster in two locations. This is why it's so important to have as many bees as you can for a large space like that. So I would forecast where your cluster historically has been. If this is your first couple of years, you won't know where they progress through there. So I would favor the cluster area over the long-term stores of honey down the line. And here's also my thinking behind that. This is emergency feed, so it's not their main feed, I hope. And uh, on days when it gets warm, so if it's over 60 degrees outside, hopefully you'll get some breaks like that. Uh, the cluster breaks up and a lot of those bees go to a known resource. So it's kind of important to set it up this time of year. So it's November, we have time, especially this weekend where I am, we have a lot of warm temperatures coming up. So if you put your fondant or your emergency feed sources on this time of year, bees have great memories and they're going to explore the hive space and they're gonna find where the resources are and this gets tucked away in their brain. So that when they need it later on, they go to that spot. If you've moved it, they demonstrate some confusion really. So when it warms up a little bit, they'll go straight to a known resource. And if that's your hive live fondant, I don't think it's gonna be critical where you put it, but I would position it if your entrance is over here, your brood is here, and your winter stores are over here, I would park it right in the middle. But the important part would be to keep it in a fixed position. I wouldn't move it around. And the other thing I wanted to mention about this, I have a life because I used this last winter for the first time. It also has an expiration date on the back, just like that. So you wanna make sure and pay attention and make sure that it's fresh. So this one expires November of 2023. So this has got some time to go. Some people are dosing their hives with heavy syrup this time of year, and they're using hive alive syrup, which I also endorse. I say that it's good because scientific studies were performed and it's been a good performer for me. If you're using this in heavy syrup, then you're double dosing when you add this. Now, does that negatively impact the bees? I don't know. But the thing that I would suggest is if you're going to put fondant on early, because these are under $5 a piece, if you're putting this on early, then you won't need to dose them with this because one of these packs has a full dose of Hive Alive already in the fondant. So you could park your syrup this time of year. And yes, I've jumped the gun and I went ahead and put my fondant packs on now. And the other interesting part is uh, last year, none of the colonies consumed all of the fondant going through winter. So this time of year, we have robbing going on, we have bees, we have questions coming up dealing with robbing. So I'll mention that later, but one of the things that I'm doing with the fondant that's left over from last year Put it in a freezer, put it in a bag, put it in the freezer, save it for summer. And uh, then you can take it out and feed it back to the bees at your robbing station this time of year, because you know what that does? If you put a syrup out, and I'm not against doing that, obviously you could put 
you know, pro suite or anything you want out for your open feeding, but it's a great way to recycle last winter's Hive Alive fondant leftovers at the robbing station because they don't just fly in and drink up a bunch of syrup and fly away fast. They have to work on it for a while. So it occupies the robbers and the surplus foragers that are out there in a period of dearth, which is what we're experiencing right now. Warm weather, dearth, perfect scenario for robbing of your hives. So that's what I would do. Find a sweet spot between where your brood currently is and then not all the way to the end because if you're insulated well, they may not use all of the honey anyway. But remember that Hive Alive is also a medication. What's it a medication for? Nozema spores. So that's it. Question number three, moving right along. Bill Van Den. Can I please ask you a question? Bees, I'm feeding them every other day. It's not that cold, but there's not much flowers around. Is this common? And in the winter time, it's gonna be above 50 degrees. How do you feed your bees in the winter time? Do you need to feed them every day? I'm a little confused about this. Can you please help me with my bees? And they're now going to my next door neighbor's hummingbird feeder. Common complaint about beekeepers by neighbors who, ha who have hummingbird feeders out is that the honeybees go after their hummingbird feeder. But I have food inside it. I understand it's probably an easier way out, but do you feed them in the winter time every day, every other day? How do you get uh, inner when it's cold? I'm not sure I understand the end of that question, but anyway, as I've already said, I put Hive Alive fondant on top of the inner covers of all the hives. And the horizontal hives this year, uh, none of them have fondant on them. And the reason for that is they have a surplus of honey, a lot of honey inside the horizontal hives. So you can put fondant, it's emergency feeding, but I'd like to address the hummingbird feeders. So when your neighbors are complaining that your honeybees are on the hummingbird feeders, bees tongues are limited in length. Hummingbirds can reach nectar that's very low in the reservoir where they're feeding. So what I highly recommend is that you help your neighbors who have hummingbird feeders out. Although, like where I live, the hummingbirds are gone already. So if you're in another climate, as it says here, you know, it's going to stay above 50. So you may be where hummingbirds are there all year round. So now we have to help educate our neighbors about the kind of hummingbird feeder. Those with reservoirs where you control the level in the bottom, the ones that have the vertical stacks in the middle and they've got a bottle up there and that's full of liquid, they continue to top off and bees can reach. So we have two ways to deal with it. One, come up with the reservoir style feeder and keep the levels low enough that the honeybee tongues can't reach the syrup or you create an extension on the little feeding accesses that is more than a quarter inch long or more than a quarter inch thick. Hummingbirds can still access the feed. Honeybees can't. They'll be frustrated and they'll leave. So work with your neighbors and get your bees out of their hummingbird syrup, which by the way is a very light consistency of sucrose. So that's pretty much it. And uh, feeding, feeding isn't necessary. If you've got honey left on your hives, it's not necessary. Commercial beekeepers, totally different thing. They've harvested all the honey. Some of them have gone to single deeps. The single deeps are not occupied with a lot of surplus honey, so they have to feed. They have to boost them right now. But backyard beekeepers, which is my target audience, um, you should have left 50 pounds of honey on if you're in the Northeast. If you're in a climate like this, um, you're going to want to talk to your fellow beekeepers that keep bees successfully through winter down there and find out what their consumption rate is. One of the reasons I really don't like to boost the nutrition of bees going into fall, for example, I don't want to put in pollen patties and things like that. Um, Randy Oliver, Scientific Beekeeping, has done a lot of studies on pollen patties in the fall feeding to find out if it's really a great benefit to the bees. Keep in mind that the frustrating part for new beekeepers is that someone's success in Texas or Oklahoma or Iowa or North Dakota, for example, may be completely different and uh, your bees may behave differently in your localized climate. That's why local beekeepers are a great resource for you. But if they have enough honey, you don't need to feed. We're not trying to boost the numbers going into winter. We're trying to guarantee their survival. So what's number one 
on your list, by the way, for keeping your bees healthy going into winter. A good population, for one, is going to last, you know, because they can, they're going to suffer attrition all the way through winter. But uh, the fondant packs I put on, that's emergency feed, so they consume honey and the fondant packs. Here's the thing, too. Some of the colonies went straight for the fondant pack. So once bees have open cells of nectar on their honey frames, so they're not capped yet, even this time of year, you'll see it. Look what we have right here. We have an observation hive, chock-a-block with bees. So by the way, this population of bees in a hive this size, that's a great population for winter. We have six medium-sized frames that are capped with honey. Now, if I put a feeder on top of this, beehive right here even though they have all the resources they need they're going to go after the feeder because that's a ready carbohydrate so they kind of go for the easy pickings first so if you were to put hive alive fondant on this which i don't plan to do but if because they have all the resources they need to get through winter but if i did put it there and made it available to them they would consume that even though there's plenty of other resources inside the hive so why would i do that let's not forget that this is not just a winter feed for your bees or a survival resource, we should consider this a medication because the material that's in here is vitamin boosted so that your bees have a healthier microbiome in the mid gut of the bees. So it's kind of twofold. It provides them an emergency carbohydrate resource so they can keep warm, but it also has nutrients in it that help them with overall bee health. But right here, this colony is getting nothing. In fact, this colony has been fed nothing. It was a swarm that was installed May 10th of this year, and that's what they look like. In fact, at other parts of the year, they never swarmed. So the original queen is in here from that swarm in spring. And uh, so these numbers have been very consistent through the year. But uh, you don't need to feed them if you've got honey there, unless you're trying to medicate your bees. Now, if you've taken all your honey off, you need a heavy syrup, uh, especially in an area where you've got 50 or better, you can uh, provide an opportunity for your bees to do cleansing flights year round. So I don't think they're under the same restrictions here. I wouldn't do it because it freezes and we have periods of weather where the bees can't get out and cleanse their hindgut. They can't eliminate. But where you are, they likely can. So now you're, it's up in the air. Your choices are much broader than mine. Uh, so even a fondant may not be necessary because that's more of a solid material, even though it is in a liquid state, it's just a very viscous liquid. Uh, you can get away with carbohydrate feeding in liquid form all year round if you're 50 or above all through winter. So local bees, but I like for my bees to match the environmental rhythm where they live and I want their numbers to decline on their own. And that's one of the points of the observation hives that are in this building. We get to see what they do on their own I have two colonies that are behind and they did get ProSweet. So ProSweet at the end of the year, it has a consistency of honey and uh, helps them. And what they did with it is they filled a lot of their honey cells, but they didn't cap them. So that's going to be consumed again as things turn bad here. The building that I'm in right now is not heated. So they're going to need those resources. But this colony, a colony that looks like this with all these resources, had the other two colonies done the same and filled their frames all the way to the top, no feed. I wouldn't do it. Easy to check. So I hope that helps. Question number five, Noah writing. Hey Fred, I found something really interesting to ask you about. It's always fun to be able to bring up things that are outside the box and traditional questions. So when you feed poultry, it takes two pounds of feed to get one pound of poultry, at least in the infant stage. Then later it turns to 2.5 pounds of feed to get one pound of poultry. After the first two months, roughly. With beef cattle, it's an enormous amount. With crickets, roaches, it's approximately 1.5 to 1.7 pounds of feed to grow one pound of meat. The younger they are, the more efficient. It's quoted often as 1.7. So your investment of food and resources to the meat gain, assuming that you're raising meat birds, so that two to one is, is pretty real. I'm a certified poultry technician with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. So chickens are my thing. They have been since the turn of the century. And uh, so it's not just about honeybees, but that food ratio of 
two pounds of feed converted to one pound of flesh. Those are usually the Cornish rock style birds, which we classify as meat birds. And to say that they live for months, that's actually pretty rare. Those that are growing them out and so that they can produce a lot of chickens and a lot of flesh in a short amount of time, a lot of the grocery store chickens that you're eating there were only five or six weeks old when they uh, were harvested because that feed conversion rate is meteoric. We've done strange things to chickens in the industry. So we're moving on. My question is, if these are the figures that it takes to grow that much animal or pounds per animal, then I'm curious what the conversion rate is for honeybees. And probably there's a certain range for Hymenoptera and insects in general. It's probably more similar to the cricket ratio than it would be, say, for poultry, beef, dogs, and cats. The reason for this question is that it leads into the other question of how bees stack resources to get their bee fat ratios up before winter and wondering how they do that part. Like for example, people say that the late summer bees will sacrifice themselves to give food for the higher fat bodied winter bees. And this would affect that also. It's also possible this is too hard to measure for beekeepers right now. And I'm sure it would be hard to figure out, but by at least thinking about it, people can theorize the use and use the idea to figure out what ideas for fattening up bees in the fall. Okay, this it is complicated and probably out of the realm for most backyard beekeepers. And uh, this is something that industry standards, these are what people think about. If you're a, a rancher and you're raising beef and you have grass fed beef and everything else, um, what you feed them is going to be part of your costs. So supplemental feeding. If you can grass range your cattle and feed them off the land, you're much ahead. For example, I know I'm going to I'm going to talk about several things here, but I've been keeping chickens for a long time and I've cycled through a lot of different breeds and they have a lot of different pros and cons, right? So different chickens do really well on open range, free range chickens. So freerangechickens.org, that's my website. Now when you have free ranging chickens, what do you want them to be able to do? So this is where this will I'll come around to what we're talking about investment versus yield. So our ROI, the investment people like that return on your investment. So I have ended up with, uh, it depends on what you want, but if you just want eggs, for example, we know that leghorns are very good leg, egg layers, egg producers. They have a very efficient what, uh, food to egg ratio. So we can go further than that. Leghorns are big birds or Mediterranean birds. There's another Mediterranean bird, the Menorca. So I have a whole flock of Menorcas right now. Why have I chosen those after 22 years of keeping backyard poultry? Well, because they're extraordinary foragers. They're intense foragers. You would say they're extreme foragers. In fact, you never have to trim the grass around their chicken coops. We have three chicken coops here and uh, the grass is always cleaned out under those coops and around the edges. Why? Because the Menorcas are eating the grass. What else are they eating? Every bug they can get their little beaks on. So they're constantly ranging. They even go into the woods. The other thing is they're fast moving and they're alert. So that means they dodge predators. So that's a trade-off, by the way. If I were after meat birds, I wouldn't have them. But instead, what I'm after is an animated backyard, excellent birds that can survive on open range because they have to be alert to hawks. They have to be alert to the day hunting fox that might come around. And uh, they're also black in color. They do well in the north. Remember that they absorb heat from the sun also when they're outside. And uh, so they consume two thirds less feed to produce the same number of eggs when compared to something like a dual purpose bird, like a Rhode Island Red or a barred Plymouth Rock. Those are heavy bodied birds. They burn more resources to do their daily tasks when they produce eggs, they're also producing meat, so they're gaining body weight, which if you're after eggs only, which is what we're doing here, we don't need a body of a bird that's bulked up with a lot of flesh on it. I need fast moving birds. By the way, my chickens take off and can fly 150 feet, 200 feet very easily. So if something comes after them, they take off. 
I have one rooster that has lost his tail feathers three years in a row to a fox. He's still here. He's still out there. He's a rose comb, actually, which is pretty interesting. He has earned his place on open range because he makes lots of noise. He runs towards predators. He makes himself available when there's a hawk or something around while the other hands, because he does his hawk call, he does his alert calls and all of the rest of the birds run and hide and they go in the coops and things like that. So the reason I bring that up is we have to consider investment on your return. So if you're after eggs, my recommendation, Menorca chickens. And you can get purebred and then continue to breed them yourself. It's easy to incubate them. They're non-broody, so you have to have an incubator to do it. And uh, that's, that's a whole nother story. So we're in the poultry realm, but here's where we come full circle to the honeybees. How much, the question here is how much we invest in feed. Now this is where you get into commercial aspects of it. So for example, if I were going to be a commercial beekeeper, I don't think I would keep them here in the state of Pennsylvania. This ties in with what we're talking about here. What does it cost to feed and maintain your bees? And how could you get the most out of them? Well, what do you want out of them? You want more bees? Do you want honey? Do you want beeswax? All of these things play. Now I mentioned that there's a lot of different breeds of chickens because some chickens are good for meat. So we could say that some, some honeybees are good for producing copious amounts of honey. And then we would say that others produce more chickens. Some are broody. Some actually uh, produce other hens. And now we have a breeding flock. Well, honeybees are the same way too. Some bees produce more bees. More bees tends to result in more honey as well. So for example, if we look at the traits of bees that survive better dealing with varroa destructor mites, if we start to look at their behavior, their not their flock size, but the colony size, the numbers tend to be smaller. They tend to reproduce quicker. And by that, I mean, reproduce another colony of bees. So now we're talking about the classification of bees where we say they're swarmy. So they generate new colonies of bees several times a year, sometimes two or three times in the same year. Now, if we're investing in our bees and we want to keep them around and we want higher numbers, that becomes an undesirable trait if our profit is derived from the number of bees that we keep, the amount of honey they produce, and then the amount of offspring, the numbers of bees that they produce, because then you split them yourselves. So if you're managing bees and you're trying to profit from nucleus hives and things like that, you don't want them swarming on their own. You want colonies like this one right here who never swarm. So you can make your splits, so you control the numbers, so you don't have losses. If you had a colony of bees that has 15 pounds, 10 pounds of bees in it, and it's a huge colony, and then they swarm successfully and get away from you, you just lost 70%. So this becomes a number crunching game. Again, if you're a backyard beekeeper, this matters not. So the backyard beekeeping for me and the colonies I have around here, um, I don't mind that they swarm. So I don't mind that they reproduce other colonies, that they keep the numbers small, because the end result of that is those tend to be healthier colonies of bees. So this can become a trade-off and people are hunting for middle ground. They want bees that produce lots of honey, that do lots of foraging, that are strong against pests and disease. And by pests, we're talking about the varroa destructor mite primarily. But uh, there are a lot of things that bees have a resistance to but this can also tie into their behavior. This rapid and frequent reproduction of new colonies reduces residual mite loads and things like that, kind of on their own, which means that if you do a treatment, when it's necessary, you find that the mite loads are marginal, just enough to require treatment, and that the response to treatment is really good. Flip side of that, Bees that have kept in the past that you ended up with four supers, five supers, huge colonies of bees. Likewise, one of the things that came along with that massive production rate were high varroa mite numbers. So the treatment requirements of that colony were much higher, but the yields were also higher. If we're looking for bees to make splits with, if we were looking for honey to harvest and sell. So these are all trade-offs that come around 
And uh, if you can do that through the years and cycle through your own bees and you'll start to identify those that are sticking around, that are keeping uh, more honey and that you're going into winter with a larger stock of bees, you also may end up having to feed them in a colder climate, which is why I say, if I were going to keep them commercially, I think I would move to a more mild climate, not a desert climate, but a milder climate where the bees will not be so challenged in winter and where they could continue to have a reasonable amount of brood so that come springtime, I am reproducing my own bees and now I have more product to sell. Backyard beekeeper, commercial beekeeper, different approaches. So number crunching about uh, what it costs. And this is why this relates again to the chickens that were part of Noah's example here. We know the chickens that forage, for example, burn calories. So that's meat off their bones. Look at feedlots, by the way, where you're not allowed to take pictures of the cattle there. I've driven past feedlots on my way to LA and uh, you see thousands of cows in very tight areas and they require a lot of moisture, so they require a lot of water and they require a lot of corn-based products and stuff that they wouldn't find on open range. But the point is, if you can limit their movements, you increase your profits by making them heavier. So those that have free ranging cattle and grass fed beef, uh, they're not gonna be as heavy as fast as those that have smaller plots and then you're concentrating their food and resources, limiting their activity. Same thing with chickens. Chickens that run around a lot, burn calories, burn fuel, and lose pounds, right? So we're talking big numbers. So that's why I'm also not into that either. Just like backyard beekeeping, I'm also into backyard chicken keeping. So there's a DVD out there titled Regarding Chickens, and I talk about all of that. It's a three hour program on how to raise backyard chickens. But it's also an area that I'm not interested in doing with the bees. Uh, because if you have a place where it's extremely hot, they're gonna be consuming their resources. So even the honey that they bring in in spring can be consumed in July and August just because it's too hot and the environment doesn't provide forage for them. So you're gonna to have to supplemental feed. So now that's a hit on what you could otherwise earn for those bees. Now we get into fall, they start bringing in nectar again, gaining weight, everything's looking good, but then the weather turns colder. We get a series of rainstorms that keeps them inside the hive. Now they're back to consumption again. So the, the point is it's unpredictable. And the way that poultry people control that is they have grow out houses where the climate's controlled. So they make sure that they get that efficient feed to flesh conversion because they're also controlling the climate because they don't want the birds to burn calories even trying to keep themselves warm. It's very interesting and it becomes a real numbers game. So for honeybees, you would have your work cut out for you to figure out an exact number I like the tie-in here too. There are people, by the way, that are looking at insects as uh, your animal protein for consumption. I don't know how many people uh, watching right now have traveled the world before and been adventurous and eaten insects, but I had roasted grasshoppers before or roasted locusts. They wrapped them up in paper and they were salted and everything. And let me tell you what, they taste they're pretty darn good. So there's a, a thinking, there's a, a line of people out there that think about consuming insects instead of cattle, for example, or chicken. So all the proteins there, and that's why my chickens, by the way, are extremely healthy because during months like now, they're foraging all the time, they're getting fresh greens and everything else, but what's gonna happen? Uh, come winter time, they're gonna be inside their coops, there's gonna be snow everywhere, and now they're dependent upon the complete rations. So, if I were investing in poultry or a poultry operation, now I'm going to lose the money I would have made off of them because I have to feed them all through winter. And like everything else right now, the cost of chicken feed ain't chicken feed. So it's expensive to feed them when they don't have access to forage. So there again, if I were going to raise poultry for money, I don't think I'd choose my state. I think I'd move somewhere where again, you know, the chickens can be kept with minimal investment in controlling their climate so you can grow them out. So, moving on to question number six from Rob Strickland. What can you do once robbing starts other than close down the entrance, hose the offenders with a strong spray of water and or set up an open feeder 
50 feet away. By the way, 50 feet is pretty close. I would go 150 feet if I could. I closed down the entrance so that it was basically a one B at a time entrance or exit, but the robbers brought their whole army and wouldn't go away. They even came back again this morning to try again. This is incredibly frustrating. Watching a colony of bees that has had their guard down for whatever reason, maybe the entrance was too large initially, and that's why it is so critical for backyard beekeepers to please reduce your entrances. If you haven't already done it this time of year, get them reduced because robbing pressure is going to increase. And that's why we get lots of robbing questions here. But once it starts, you are in a pickle. Those bees, just as described here, the ones that have gotten through, they just, they intensify their attacks. And they don't come one at a time, they come 300, 500, 600 at a time. And they really start to defeat the defenses. The older bees in that hive are trying to defend it. As they become overwhelmed and they become defeated, and if you didn't catch it right away, that battle is kind of over. Um, so it says here, I began to repair after doing hive inspection and testing for mites. So in retrospect, having the hive open that long was my latest rookie mistake. So that's the other thing again, this time of year, if you have to get into a hive to check on something, this is another reason why in hive feeding is difficult. So, because if you have to pull off the outer cover, you have to pull off the inner cover, and then you're gonna access the areas that you're providing your feed, whether it's fondant or liquid, or however you feed your bees, the more exposed they are during that activity, it's twofold. One, they're interrupted inside, so they're disturbed. Number two, you open them up to robbing. You only need a handful of passerby honeybees to get in there and get a resource successfully and fly back to their hive they're gonna come back and they're gonna hit them hard. You're much better off if you can keep your inner cover on and do your feeding above the inner cover. And then of course, when you're swapping out feed, it's a very limited exposure time. So oddly enough, I had zero mites, which had me wondering if the Dawn soap needed to be stronger than the healthy squirt I used. If it killed all the bees in the test cup, would that be enough for the mites too? So I'm gonna, mention that briefly again this uh, dawn ultra free and clear um, dish detergent instead of an alcohol wash for example is two tablespoons per gallon of water so two tablespoons of dawn ultra to one gallon of water and make sure it's mixed really well and the mite counts on that have been better than the mite counts with the much more expensive by the way and volatile alcohol so I've decided next time to do it right, the way to be. It would be carefully measured on dish soap ahead of time. So the robbing, you know, I'm just gonna talk about it again. This is a robbing screen that I like, by the way. I like several robbing screens, but I've given this one some real thought as to why it works so well. First of all, light passes right through it really easily. So the bees are confused and that's our game. If you've got a hive, heaven forbid this is happening after the robbing has started, but we want to frustrate them. We also want gaps like this to exist. The more gaps that the bees cannot pass through, the better. And that's because robbing bees, non-resident bees are going to come to this. They're going to smell the honey or the feeding that you've got going on in there. Whatever it is, they're going to constantly go after these little slits and holes because they can smell it. They smell the resources in there and they're just going to ping on this. Meanwhile, the resident bees get one of these tops open here. So these are pretty thick, by the way. A lot of space in here for the bees to come out their entrance and come up here and go out. So each day during the night, you would close one side and you would open the next side. So the morning's foragers come out and they have a new entrance. Much better that your resident bees are a little bit frustrated with new entrances than that you should let the previous day's bees return the robbers and get in. 
That's why they're constantly checking the sides, the cover, under the hive, and everything else. Robbers are looking for another way in so they can get past guards. If the guards have been defeated, we also need to consider something else. Maybe this colony can't defend itself. It may be queenless. Often when a colony uh, gets robbed initially, it's because your queen is absent. The colony is not sending a strong pheromone out. Um, sometimes the resident bees in that colony are not, they're kind of half-hearted in their defensive practices. That's why at the end of today's video, I'm going to show you another video that shows healthy landing boards and guard bees, and they're defending themselves extremely well. This is an opportunity for you to head off potential robbing by taking the time, getting your cup of coffee or whatever you drink, and go out there and look at every landing board and see what the activity is. You should see a regular, once the weather is nice and warm, as it is right now, you would expect to see guards in healthy numbers on every landing board. If you've got one that seems unguarded at a time when every other landing board in your backyard apiary has lots of activity and lots of guards and some of them are static, uh, already out, exposed on the landing board, and then this other one is not active at all, you might actually be queenless. So this can help uh, be smart designs also makes the probably the standard almost it's the white um, robbing screen and if you can make your own uh, robbing screens there probably is a video out there that shows you how to do that and you can use stainless steel screen again create a, a space and a framework around it and then the ability to open the top we want to redirect traffic incoming and outgoing from your hive so it frustrates robbers Wasps are really bad at being able to figure things out. And there's a brand new uh, beehive bottom out by this company, by Cirocell. I have them in a box, I haven't even opened them yet. But one of the things that I liked about it, and it's something that you could probably do on your own as well, they took advantage of the fact that robbing wasps go underneath the hive a lot. And they have a containment system under the hive with little cones that the wasps go in they can't get out. So it's actually a pretty good way to collect wasps this time of year. There's nothing more frustrating than to watch yellow jacket wasps get right past the guards and uh, get into your hive and start consuming those valuable resources, causing your bees to lose weight as a colony. That's kind of, if you look at it, the superorganism as a single animal, is it gaining weight, is it losing weight? And when they're losing weight, we have to understand why they're doing that. So it is true, as another uh, person who posted a question mentioned, that uh, some of the older nurse bees, for example, when they're producing these fat-bodied winter nurse bees, fat-bodied winter bees, which we should really call dearth bees because they'll also do it other times of year, they'll produce these fat-bodied bees, um, they do uh, cut back on feeding other things. One of the things they stop feeding would be the drones. So they do set aside that's part of a eusocial structure when it comes to honeybees is that worker bees can suppress their own needs and their, their own desires and their own kind of design. They put that in suspension so that they can favor the queen, for example, so she can lay eggs. Uh, because we know that worker bees in the absence of a queen can also reactivate and uh, go ahead and reactivate their ovaries that they have and they can start producing eggs, and that's why you end up with drone-laying colonies that are without a queen for three or more weeks. So there's a lot going on, it's very complex. So that's what I wanted to talk about. So we have videos at the end to show you, so stick around after this, um, and I'll narrate those landing board observations. I wanna thank the Hillbilly Beekeeper for making his video and uh, kind of celebrating his appreciation for the quality of the videos that I put out on this channel. So thank you very much for that. Also, please check down in the video description for other useful links. If you've got a favorite video on YouTube that you've seen where someone teaches you how to make a really good robbing screen with minimal materials and it's very effective, so hopefully it's somebody that you've tested it, you like it, you know it works, shoot, you know, post that link. Now, when you post a link in the comment section of any of my videos, you feel like your, your comment disappeared. What really happened was, because there's a link associated with it, it automatically gets held in suspension until I come back and release it. That prevents spamming. But uh, if you've got a recommended video, instead of a shout out today right now, 
I'll include the shout out down in the video description and it will be a video to someone that you think makes a really good robbing screen. And I'll share that information. So thanks for watching. I hope you have a fantastic weekend and enjoy the landing board observations to follow. Thanks for being here. Have a great weekend. So here we are out in the bee yard, of course, just as I promised. We're looking at a landing board here. What kind of hive is that? That's an Apa May hive. But what's important here is looking at the guard posture here. Now there is a nucleus of bees in this hive. If you looked at the way we set it up, there will be a link down in the video description if you want to see more about the Apa May. Look who's hovering around here. That is a yellow jacket queen. Look how big she is. Look at her abdomen. She is looking for an opportunity to get in there. And look at the guard bees reaching up to her with their four limbs. Look at their mandibles. They're open. They're not going to play games with any of these yellow jackets. That's the kind of landing board activity you should see this time of year. Healthy colony, strong, well defended. Now here's something in real time. Another honeybee colony, also very healthy. Look what's going on here though. See the bees with the really big eyes that come together at the top? Those are drones, male honeybees. This time of year, they should be in short supply. So what on earth is going on with this landing board? The activity is great. You don't see a bunch of debris and little bits and pieces strewn around. We don't see any fighting going on. Those are all key things to observe. So what I highly suspect happened is that this colony generated a new queen late in the year. It's November for Pete's sakes. This sequence was shot the last week of October. So I think a virgin queen matured inside this colony and I think that she flew out. I think she did a successful mating flight and then returned and who followed her back but a bunch of drones. Another thing that can happen during flights like that and why I think it was a mating flight is you also can receive a whole bunch of new unrelated worker honeybees as a bonus for the colony. Honeybees are not necessarily always faithful to the colony that they reside in. So they have a tendency to just hitch a ride when they see a freshly mated queen flying back uh, to her hive. I don't understand why they do that, but it explains a lot when it comes to drift and a sudden boost in numbers in your hive along with a whole bunch of drones. And what would you expect to see happening after you see this rush of drones at the landing board if it's related to mating? Well, you should see the drones depart yeah. soon. So we're gonna go to a slow motion sequence so you can see what's going on here. There they are. Workers coming in. Look at all those big drone heads there. They're departing. So within an hour, of this rush of drones which you can by the way here it sounds like a swarm which can be alarming to a new beekeeper it sounds like there's too much going on this is not the time of year for a colony to generate a new colony of bees so they wouldn't necessarily be swarming now the other thing is all the other activity here is normal we have foragers coming in drones are departing and we even have some worker bees coming in with pollen on their hind legs which is good to see so I suspect that we have a new queen. She was mated, she came back, the drones visited, they got fed, and they flew away. This time of year in other colonies, the brood is in decline, and they are no longer feeding their drones. So the drones don't get to stick around for very long. What happens to them this time of year? What happens to male bees at the end of October and the beginning of November? They get tossed. Now we're back on the APMA landing board here, and there's some fighting going on. I think that's healthy. The entrance is reduced because there's only a five frame colony in here. They do have a feeder on top. 
And you can see here that there's a worker really giving it to a bee that does not belong. So they cling to them, they bite them, and uh, if things get really bad, they can also sting them. Where do they try to get their stingers in? They tend to put their stingers in underneath the wing on the thorax there. Also, when bees are in a skirmish like this and they're getting scrappy, they can even pheromone mark the uninvited guest and other worker bees on the landing board may also join in. So there's a healthy collection of guard bees on here. This one's just getting away. No robbery. Look at their mandibles opening and closing. They are ready to bite the next one that comes in. Here's another one. Look how they bite the wings. They're biting the legs. They're ganging up on this one. This is really what we want to see happen. If a forager from another colony comes and they visit a hive and they're trying to get in and get some of their resources, nectar is what they're primarily after this time of year. If they can get in, get the nectar, fill up and fly out, that means they come back with more later. So we really count on a healthy population of guard bees like these right here to make sure that those scouts don't get in. And the scouts that are coming out are some of the oldest bees in the colony, of course. They're probably considered expendable. They're willing to fight, but this one does not get injured that I can tell, even though you can see they're really trying and uh, biting as hard as they can. But, you know, their mandibles are designed for working wax, working pollen, smoothing propolis around inside the hive, which we hope to see a bunch of this time of year. Back to full speed, back to the original colony that had the drones on it. But what I want you to notice here is what that should sound like. So don't be alarmed when you hear this. If everything is otherwise tidy, plus the activity at the entrance is normal, look at the pollen coming in. Look at the foragers just scooting past all the commotion on the landing board and uh, the drones are leaving. So no big deal. Not the end of the world there for that colony. Back to slow motion on the Ape of May. I like to get these slow motion sequences and show how the guard bees do their thing. Sometimes a bumblebee will land on the landing board also, but this particular Ape May hive has a mouse guard built into it and bumblebees cannot fit through the opening. So if you are someone who likes to put in mouse guards and things like that for wintering, this would be a good time of year, of course, to do that. Try to do as few changes as you can to your configurations, but we definitely want the hive entrances small enough to be defended. Here we are again, full speed. So you can hear it, you can see the activity. On very hot days, after we've had these cold uh, nights down in the 30s, usually from 11 or 12 to about three or four in the afternoon, you should see peak activity here. And we have far more foragers than we do resources for them to bring in. So activity like this is really kind of rare. There's a lot going on with this particular colony. The population is strong. They have over 50 pounds of honey stored. So they have a deep brood box and they have a medium super full of honey. So this colony is doing well. Notice that we put a screen there too, stainless steel. That is so they can fan air through it, but also have a small enough opening that they can guard it, defend it and protect themselves from wasps this time of year and of course foragers robbers from other colonies the numbers here are good i just wanted you to be able to hear it look at the fanning that's going on here and otherwise normal behavior and within an hour the drones were gone so you can see that the drone numbers are even thinning down now it's not unusual to find drones from a variety of other colonies showing up at any of the colonies so they're also a form of drift but this time of year, uh, they just don't need them. So they make great uh, training tools. If you have kids that want to learn to hold a bee, drones are good for that. You'll find them out on the landing boards early in the morning because they've been blocked from being fed and they just are left out literally in the cold 
overnight. Now some other things to think about this time of year. Hopefully you're buttoned up. Uh, you don't want to continually reconfigure your hive. So whatever your winter configuration is, it's a good idea to do that while you still have plenty of warm days ahead. And that's so that the bees can seal up the joints with propolis. You notice there's a propolis seal going on, the entrance reducer here. There's also a slatted rack on this hive. It's all sealed up with propolis as well. So I would not personally go all the way down to the bottom board to see what's going on in a hive this time of year. I would suggest that if you have not done mite counts, this would be your last opportunity to get those numbers and find out what the status is of your hives because you want to be able to button them up. If you're using insulation, that should be on now. And uh, if you're going to put on feed, here we are, November the 4th, we could put on fondant now. And then you would be hands off as far as feeding and everything else goes. And we are coming up on a prime opportunity, by the way, to treat them for mites if you had high mite counts. Here's another uninvited guest being ushered out just off center there to the left, chewed on by the resident bees. But you could, uh, at the end of this month, end of November, historically here in the state of Pennsylvania has been the best time to treat with oxalic acid vaporization. And that's because the mites are going to be phoretic. There are going to be more of them exposed. Your brood will be at the smallest of the year, historically speaking. And we can do a single treatment and get, based on research, we can get 96% efficacy, which means 96 out of 100 mites will be dead. I highly recommend also clean your bottom boards. If you've got the kind with uh, inserts that can be pulled out, if you've got trays that can be removed, it's a great time of year to clean those out really well. And then you'll be able to see what the mite drop is after you do your oxalic acid vaporization treatment. So those are the things I recommend this time of year. Final configurations, also make sure your boxes are all lined up correctly. You can use a bar clamp to align them without pulling the boxes apart. You can even align full boxes that way. Put your insulated inner covers on, I highly recommend those. Get your fondant on if that's what you're going to feed. Dry sugar works too. And just have them ready because the weather can go bad and stay bad. So I want to thank you for watching this little bonus round today. And I hope that uh, you're ready for winter wherever you are. Thanks again for being here.